Thus, in the Orthodox view, our relationship to the environment is not an external one, rather it is an internal one, constituent of who we actually are. In light of this view, the disposition of a servant and the stewardship model fall a little bit short. Granting all that it has to offer, and it does offer a great deal, we would like to propose that there is still a more excellent way, and that is the disposition of a son. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. Rooted in the tradition of the Orthodox Church and its teaching on the relationship between God, humanity, and all creation, Father Butler and Professor Morris take the discussion of Orthodox environmental ethics from the abstract principles to thoughtful interaction with the concrete, always sensitive to the inviolability of human dignity, the plight of the poor, and our common pursuit of communion with God. This presentation was delivered as part of the 2015 Acton Lecture Series. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you could help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Well, it is a pleasure, as always, to be back here. This is my first time in the fabulous new facility. And I wanted to start off by saying an economist and a priest walk into a bar. But I couldn't really get anything after that. So I'm going to... After later on, we will be walking into a bar, and you can join us uh, if, if you like. Um, this, this project began uh, when I was one of Father Michael's parishioners, indeed, he he led my family and I into the Orthodox Church, for which we are eternally grateful to him. And um, we had a long series of conversations about the environment, and we went places like Montana and went hiking. So we like the environment, uh, which is something that always surprises my uh, left-wing friends, uh, that I, I don't want to despoil the environment. Uh, and we spent some of that time talking about the problems we saw in uh, the Orthodox reaction in particular, but in Christian reaction to environmentalism uh, generally. And since he's got the theological background and I've spent a lot of time working on environmental regulation and how environmental regulation works, uh, we had a lot to talk about. And w the first observation we really wrestled with was that the first instinct people have to address a problem often isn't the right one. Right? So we, we identify a problem and our instinct is to do something. And this is, this is really a problem in, in legal education because lawyers think that if you pass a law, you've solved the problem. And they don't talk about whether people are going to follow the law or whether the law creates perverse incentives or things like that. And so um, a classic example of that is the Endangered Species Act. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But it's a very well-intentioned law, a law intended to do uh, something good, which has actually turned out to have perverse uh, effects because it gets the incentives wrong for landowners. It encourages the destruction of habitat rather than uh, protecting it. Another uh, problem is there's a lot of blurring of lines uh, by people who ought to know better. Uh, we're, we're all environmentalists now. Uh, so uh, Richard Darman, who was the first President Bush's uh, director of the Office of Management and Budget, and so sort of the uh, chief evildoer among many evildoers, uh, from the environmental point of view, uh, explicitly said that. He said, we're all environmentalists now. There's nobody who isn't an environmentalist. The, the issue is, how do we deal with it? Um, so we like the outdoors. We like clean air. We like clean water and so forth. But uh, one thing that the political groups that support more government action have been very good at is persuading people that there's a good side and a bad side. It's not a discussion about the most effective way to do things. It's a discussion about being good or evil. And that's a, I think that's a problem. That's one that we wrestled with in this uh, monograph. So I want to spend a few minutes sort of setting up the, this problem and then turn it over to the more theologically sophisticated member of the partnership. And let me start with two particular problems that uh, we have that, from an orthodox perspective. And the first is uh, Deacon uh, Dr. John, say it, say it louder, that, that, what, you heard what he said. 
uh, who's a theological advisor to the ecumenical patriarch and uh, on environmental issues. And he said, uh, this is a quote of his, he says, in his now classic article entitled The Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, Lynn White already suspected although he did not elaborate on the truth behind asceticism. And then proceeds to spin out the, need, the, the notion that orthodoxy in particular endorses an ascetic lifestyle in order to protect the earth. And the problem with this is that, uh, in fact, I hope that the deacon had not actually read Lynn White's article, which is a foundational text of the environmental movement published in the late 1960s in Science Magazine. Because uh, White explicitly blamed the environmental problems, and you, were, you, know, this is, you know, leading up to the first Earth Day, on Christianity, which he termed the most anthropocentric, anthropo he does the big words, uh, anthropocentric religion in uh, the world has ever seen. Now, that's clearly false to anyone who spent any time talking about any version of Christianity, which is not man-centered, right? It's God-centered. It's Christ-centered. Uh, and uh, he argued, actually, explicitly that pre-Christian religions had fostered a reverence for nature and he went on to note that the belief in what he called guardian spirits of the hills, streams, and trees, where one before one cut a tree, mined a mountain, or dammed a brook, it was important to placate the spirit in charge of that particular situation to keep it placated, and that Christianity's destruction of these animistic religions and replacement is what caused environmental problems is we weren't placating the spirits of the trees. Now, I find it really troubling that the advisor to the ecumenical patriarch thinks it is a good idea to placate spirits of trees. I don't think that's uh, Christianity. And uh, his argument that returning to uh, pre-Christian religious beliefs about nature is environmentally beneficial is really also factually just wrong. So we get this notion that, you know, for example, the Native Americans used every part of the buffalo. Well, if you go to Bozeman, you can go to the buffalo jump where they would run a herd of buffalo off the cliff. So several thousand buffalo lying at the bottom of a cliff, I don't think every part of them got used, right? So we're talking about if you, if you have to run after a buffalo and you can only catch one, you're going to use all of it. But when you figure out how to run a whole bunch of them off a cliff, you're not. So we have this, this sort of romanticization of the past and, and these inaccurate things. And, and to, in, to invoke that, I think, is problematic. So White, at best, was theologically confused. And endorsing his views is theologically confused at best. Uh, and so, you know, this, so, so we have a problem there. And the second is the patriarch himself. And uh, John uh, mentioned his uh, message on the nuclear explosion at Fukushima. Fuki, we're just letting him do all the hard words. And in March 2011, right, right just three days after the disaster in Japan. And he said, with all due respect to the science and technology of nuclear energy and for the sake of the survival of the human race, we counterpropose the safer green forms of energy, which both moderately preserve our natural resources and mindfully serve our human needs. Our creator granted us the gifts of the sun, wind, water, and ocean, all of which may safely and sufficiently provide energy. Ecologically friendly science and technology has discovered ways and means of producing sustainable forms of energy for our ecosystem. Therefore, we ask, why do we persist in adopting such dangerous sources of energy? Now, the obvious answer to this is that the gifts of the sun, wind, water, and ocean are insufficient to supply the energy we need uh, to sustain the number of people who live in the world today. Indeed, the number one air pollution in the problem, to, problem in the world today uh, is not uh, the burning of uh, fossil fuels. It is the burning of biomass indoors in the homes of poor people in developing countries which puts particulates in the air and harms the health, particularly of women and children, who are the ones who are spending the time indoors. And that would be helped a lot by some more central power stations, burning natural gas or coal. Uh, that would improve the lives of a lot of people. And if we're going to talk about greenhouse gases, and we think that's the biggest problem, nuclear energy must play a role in that, because it's the only technology we'd have that generates sufficient energy. Now, I don't have a view one way or another on, on, on nuclear energy, but I just think it's, it's, it's remarkable for someone in a position of authority to come out and make a statement that we can sufficiently provide for our energy needs from sources of energy that do not sufficiently provide for our energy needs. I think God gave us minds for a reason, and we, he wants us to think about how to be good stewards, and that's including learning some facts. So if we think about these problems and try to develop a way of thinking about the environment, here's what we think does work, right? So I'll just give you one example, and then, then we'll get into the theology and the big words. Um, so consider the Endangered Species Act. 
And this is an, a, a statute that has been, is, is uh, beloved and is a symbol of our commitment to the environment and so forth. It's been called Noah's Ark by the National Audubon Society, by Al Gore, and by uh, Calvin DeWitt, who is a co-founder of the Evangelical Environmental Network. So lots of people call it uh, a Noah's Ark or an Ark to the Future. It's a really leaky ark. Uh, if Noah had built that ark, no, no animals. Um, almost no species have been removed from the endangered species list. Right? Environmental groups themselves will often admit that it has not worked in that sense. And the ones that have been removed have been removed because they were put on the list by mistake or they went extinct. We haven't had recovery of species. Right? So the act is not working. Now, why is that? There's two reasons. One, it was passed in the early 1970s, and we've learned a lot since then. It's remarkable. And one of the things we learned that we didn't know then was how important habitat is as opposed to species. So if you protect the habitat, you get species. This is a species-oriented act, not a habitat-oriented act. So it just doesn't, it's not accomplishing its goal. And so in a rational world, we might, we might address that. The other is that it creates really bad incentives. So if you have an endangered species on your land, your land just became less valuable because now you're subject to a whole lot of restrictions about how you can use your land. And some economists did a study of a land in North Carolina where the red cockaded woodpecker lives. And red cockaded woodpeckers like pine trees that are between 40 and 60 years old. And the pine trees tend to live to be about 80, and then they fall over. So the red cockaded woodpecker flies around looking for a, a 40 to 60 year old tree to live in. Now, if you cut the tree down before it's 40, it's not going to live there. And if you wait and let it fall down when it's 80, it'll go away. So what happened when people found this endangered species, the more of these birds that were found in an area, the earlier people cut down their trees. Right? The incentive was created to reduce the habitat because once those birds came in, you had to sort of protect an area around the nesting bird so it wouldn't be disturbed while it was mating and so forth. Now, I think red cockaded woodpeckers are pretty neat birds. And I should have, I should have brought a picture, but it would have been the only slide and it didn't seem worth it. But they're really, they're pretty birds and I'd like to see one. And it's good to protect their habitat. And indeed, landowners often manage their property to protect their habitat. And there was a, a landowner in North Carolina who became famous because he did a lot of management on his own just because he liked birds. But once he found out the cost to him in his timber management practices, he stopped doing it. And the problem is we are creating incentives for people to behave badly. And so as an economist, I'm not surprised when people do what we create incentives for. And as a Christian, I'm not surprised if people behave badly because we understand that human beings are fallen creatures. So if we want to put those two things together, we should create some incentives to help people do the right thing. Uh, and so if we really wanted a Noah's Ark for endangered species, I think we need to build one that's seaworthy. And uh, that lesson then led us to go back into the uh, theological ideas to sort of see what does orthodoxy tell us about how to build a seaworthy ark. So I will turn it over to Father Michael, who didn't know he had to do construction. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Morris. I like saying that since it's his new job. Now I have to use big words correctly and I have to construct an ark. I don't know that's quite what I set out to do. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Morris says, I get to talk a little bit more uh, about theology here and to see what is it that the Orthodox Church provides theologically in order to give us some understanding and some underpinning for addressing environmental issues. The first place, um, you know, given the problems that Andy has just enumerated, and in the beginning of our book we also uh, list a few other ones, we like to propose that any sober orthodox approach to environmentalism is going to require not only a faithful reading of the orthodox tradition and the scriptures, but also a critical engagement with everybody else who's working on the issue not a simple facile adoption of activist principle and policy, which we found to be the case. So um, our collaboration uh, was a first step in addressing um, uh, an interdisciplinary approach, if you will, uh, something which Acton is very good at doing. And so ultimately, I think issues of environmental concern will work best when they involve not only theology and science, but philosophy and ethics, law and politics and economics, and take serious account of all of them, 
together. Having said that, we start at the beginning. A contemporary Orthodox theologian, Father Andrew Luth, has pointed out it's often claimed that one of the characteristics of Orthodox theology is that it has a cosmic dimension. That is, of course, the incarnation of Christ, the fall of man, our redemption, our salvation is all central to uh, the concerns of orthodoxy, but the church has always situated those central human concerns within a broader um, embrace, a larger horizon that embraces the whole of creation and sees the work of Christ in literally cosmic terms. So the church's goal is not only the salvation of the people in this world, but also the salvation and restoration of the entire world itself. This cosmic horizon finds its scriptural basis, of course, in St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, where he writes, Creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, and not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail together until now. That's the basis of it. St. Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century will talk about the recapitulation of all things in Christ. And we'd like to suggest that the development of a cosmic dimension to Orthodox theology is one of the fundamental contributions that Orthodoxy can make to Christians in contemporary environmental discussions. To go in that a little more deeply, when we say that God created the heavens and the earth, we remember that our God is a Trinitarian God, and that the act of creation was a free act of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all working cooperatively. This is articulated many times by the fathers of the church. Perhaps the easiest uh, summary of it is to find it in the creed uh, which most all Christian confessions maintain, the Nicene Creed, which acknowledges that the Father is the maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, that the Son is he through whom all things were made, and that the Holy Spirit himself is the giver of life. How it is that God created the heavens and the earth is subject of a little more speculation. And here uh, I, I do have to do a little theological deep think at its darkest and murkiest and take a foray into a little bit of deeper waters here. Um, uh, I beg your indulgence and, uh, and your attention as well. We have to go to one of my favorite theologians, St. Maximus the Confessor, um, who gives us really one of the most complete explanations in Orthodox theology of how God created the world. Maximus states straightforwardly, Always and in all, the word of God wills to effect the mystery of his embodiment. That is, the word, the logos in Greek, is embodied in the world and creates the world by means of what he calls logi, words, reasons, principles, if you will, that come from him. These logi are the predeterminations or the products of the divine will by which God creates everything and imparts to everything its unique characteristics. Uh, Maximus does not understand the Logi to be a kind of collection of ideal platonic forms in the mind of God. The Orthodox Church has always uh, rejected that notion. On the contrary, the Logos remains one and simple and uncompounded as befits God. But the act of creation itself is the differentiation of these Logi, which become multiple in creation while remaining one and simple in the divine Logos. When God wills someone into existence or something into existence, um, uh, for example, Andy. When God speaks Andy, then it causes Andy to be. Because prior to God saying fiat Andy, there was no Andy to speak of. Okay, so it causes, logos causes something to be. It's also the principle of his being or the definition of who he is. When God speaks Andy, he doesn't mean a generic human being or a generic man. He means a specific man who is Andy Morris. But it also includes not just it doesn't just cause him to be or defines who he is, but it also points to the divine intention or purpose for which God created Andy. For as we said, God's ultimate purpose is to unite everything and everyone to himself. And if anyone has a place in God's economy of salvation, it's Andy Morris. So the notion of a logos or these logi is important here, all right? They are simply the eminence of divine wisdom or the presence of the word of God in creation. And because the word of God is at the same time the cause and the source of all the logi, 
sustains them in existence, and is their ultimate purpose at the end, the Logos, Christ the Word, is the unifying, all-embracing cosmic presence who is everywhere present and fills all things, as one of our prayers has it, but who is not embraced or circumscribed by anything. This is the way, and I admit that's a little heavy for right after lunch, but Maximus says this is the way the Word of God is embodied in creation, and we need a clear theology of the presence of God in creation, his imminence, not simply his transcendence, but his imminence in the world, because it allows of us to speak of God present in the world that does not lead us into pantheism, which is the er- or into the errors of the so-called deep ecologists who want to deify nature itself and worship Gaia. All right? So the language that I've just articulated or tried to articulate gives us a way out of that and still allows us to speak of God present in creation. What is the place of mankind or humanity in creation? There is a reciprocal relationship between man and the world. Again, uh, following mostly upon St. Maximus's work, Maximus will speak of man as a microcosm or a little world because he is both visible and invisible. We are made up of a body and of a soul. We have a unity and diversity just like the rest of the created world has. The Eastern Fathers of the 4th century did get this idea from ancient Greek sources, but they took it up and they reinterpreted it in a Christian context. Because we're made up of a rational soul, we are like the spiritual nature of the angels and the other incorporeal powers who share a likeness to the rational God. The same time, because we have a body, we are like everything else that is in the physical world as well. So that gives us a unique place in creation, for we are the only creature that shares both realms, and therefore we are the only ones who are fit to be called a microcosm of the whole creation, standing between the incorporeal and the corporeal. The classic statement of man's place in creation uh, is found in St. Gregory the Theologian and repeated verbatim by him by St. John of Damascus several centuries later. Man, they said, made from both corporeal and incorporeal natures is, to quote, a great cosmos in miniature, an angel, a hybrid worshiper, a full initiate of the visible creation, and initiated also into the intelligible creation, a king of things on earth, but subject to the king above, a creature trained here and en route to somewhere else, and the ultimate mystery deified by his tendency toward God. Now man's role as a microcosm is in service to his role as a mediator of the salvation of the entire creation. That is, the idea of man as a microcosm is linked to a task of mediation. That is, of unifying through himself all of the disparate and various facets of creation. We're not simply to be a microcosm, like an image or an icon of the world. We have to function as one as well. To gather up into ourselves all the varied elements of the created order, mortal and immortal, rational and irrational beings, everything, so that we are then able to offer them up to God. Um, Having said that man is a microcosm, we look a little further as how that role functions in the salvation of the world. And here I turn to a contemporary or near contemporary Romanian theologian, Father Dimitrius Staniloi, who passed away in 1993. But he takes these ideas and he pushes them a step further to underscore the real centrality of man in creation. And it's important to reaffirm that because even among Christian environmentalists, we find sometimes a tendency to want to downplay the centrality of humanity in the created order. All right? But Father Dimitri will say that a man is not a part of of creation at all, but rather that creation is a part of man. It's not that man is a part of the cosmos, but that all the parts of the cosmos are parts of man, he says. Man is not a microcosm cited by the macrocosm, nor is he framed within the macrocosm, but he is the actual cosmos itself, as he gives a complete unity and a complete meaning to all the parts of creation. This is because creation itself is not personal. That is to say, it has its own nature, but it does not have its own personhood, no hypostasis of its own. Adam was intended to serve as the microcosm of the world. But through the fall, he lost the ability to fulfill that cosmic task. Christ, through his passion, death, and resurrection, fulfilled it. And we, united to Christ in baptism, are able to fulfill it now. 
Thus, Christian teaching stands in opposition again to those deep ecologists who want to personify nature in the person of Gaia, or to pantheists who claim that nature is God, or even to those animists who claim that there are all kinds of little deities running around animating creation. Given this articulation of the world, that creation is a Trinitarian act, that God is imminent in creation through the expression of the Logi, that man is central to the created order, that he has a role as a microcosm and a mediator of the salvation of the world, we can look at how it is that we might live in such a world given this understanding. There is a somewhat of a hierarchy of considered. Go imagine that, an Orthodox priest talking about a hierarchy. Uh, there's a hierarchy of considerations in how we might look at environmental issues. To begin with, we might simply want to wait for the second coming of Christ, when uh, the creation will be healed and everything will be restored in the new heavens and the new earth, and Christ will be all in all. Uh, maybe we don't want to wait that long, and people are perhaps a little antsy to do more up front and now. So maybe in the next place, we would like to suggest that everyone, including you, gentle listeners, attain holiness and become saints, so that we are not overcome by our passions, so that we are not led to use the world or each other in sinful and selfish ways, nor because of our distance from God and the darkness of our minds will we stumble around without his grace and illumination which guides us in ways that are consistent with the proper use of the world according to its logi. Orthodox tradition bears clear witness to the possibility and the effectiveness of the, this approach in the lives of the saints. We're all familiar you know, with the stories of saints and, and animals. Francis of Assisi is, of course, well known. You know, he didn't just like birds, he preached to birds. And why was he able to do that? It's because he got on with them and they weren't afraid of him. Why? Because he was holy enough that his relationship not only with God and with his neighbor, but with the created order was healed as well. And you know, saints living in communion or in close proximity with all kinds of animals, this is a hagiographical commonplace in both the East and the West. You know, there's all kinds of stories of saints with lions and crocodiles and bears and eagles and whatnot, and they get along just fine. And it's because they have become holy that they then exemplify and show us what a healed humanity and a healed world can look like when it lives in harmony. So I don't say become saints lightly. I really do mean it. That's ultimately what will heal the world and save the environment. But maybe that takes a little too much work and we want something more short term. So next, I suggest that we will practice something which is called natural contemplation, which I'll explain a little more in a, in a few minutes. By discerning these logi of things, the reason that God created the world and the purpose he has for the world, so that by discerning the Logi in the world, our minds can rise to the divine Logos himself, and being illumined by grace, we can see how to use the things of the world properly, according to God's intended purpose for them, and not abusively, that is, in ways that run contrary to God's design. Maybe we can't do that either, though I would argue that it is possible and reasonable, and to some degree it's necessary. But maybe we're too weak for that, so we can only prepare a little something for ourselves. So we'll start with a few more simple and practical things and leave some higher considerations for a little later. What I'd like to suggest is that there are three possible ways of living in the created world. By extension, they point to ways of relating to our neighbor and to the world. Now, this illustration is taken from St. Basil the Great, uh, but it's found in several of the other fathers as well. St. Basil says, in all, I observe three different dispositions which lead invariably to obedience. Either we turn aside from evil from the fear of punishment and so are in a servile disposition, or seeking the profits of a wage, we fulfill what is enjoined for the sake of our own profit and are therefore like mercenaries, or else we do so for the good itself and for love of him who gave us the law, rejoicing, though worthy of serving so glorious and good God, in which cause we are surely in the disposition of sons. Therefore, the three dispositions are that of a slave, a servant, or a son. Now, a slave obeys the father out of fear of punishment, or out of fear of hell. The analog among environmentalists, of course, is the fear-mongering language we're so often familiar with of crisis, catastrophe, apocalypse, global disaster, total cataclysm, and all of that sort of stuff. 
Uh, for example, Paul Ehrlich, beginning with the population bomb in 1968, has built a long career out of predicting environmental disasters which never seem to arrive. Uh, we acknowledge that fear can be a powerful incentive for action. Uh, I'm sure some of you have uh, enjoyed fire and brimstone sermons uh, and know that it can be a great spur for action or for reform of life. But actions based on fear, because they're founded on emotion and not on clear reasoning, tend toward the irrational and are therefore untrustworthy. We prefer that our witness not be a slavish one, therefore, born out of fear, but a hopeful one grounded in a better rationale. The Orthodox, therefore, should reject the tendency towards apocalyptic rhetoric among environmentalists. Uh, and I suggest that the rest of you do, too. Uh, the second disposition is that of a servant. This is more hopeful and can be found um, in the servant who obeys the father out of a desire for reward. You know, for Christians, the desire for heaven, which is certainly laudable, or more imminently, a desire for a better world, for a cleaner air and water, and maybe for a cleaner conscience as well. And here, a whole lot of work has been done uh, by Christian environmentalists, and this is where we find the notion of Christian stewardship as the model of Christian care for the world. The, liter the literature on stewardship is really quite vast. Uh, and there's much of the stewardship model that we find very positive and very helpful. If you're interested in stewardship, Act in itself has a fine selection of resources and people here who have worked on Christian stewardship. And uh, I'm sure any of the Acton folk will be glad to, to direct you to some of those resources. However, the disposition of a servant, while certainly better than that of a slave, is not ultimately the best one. We still have to talk about a son here in a minute. So a servant and the stewardship model work out of a master-servant relationship and seem to imply a managerial approach to creation, one in which humanity is set over and above the creation and relates to it in an external way. It does not require, for example, seeing beyond the outward appearance of things to discerning their inner principle or logi, or how God's intentions for creation are related to the whole creation or, in fact, to God himself. It does not require that we see man as a microcosm of creation, and it is far from the idea that creation is a part of mankind. Thus, in the orthodox view, our relationship to the environment is not an external one, rather it is an internal one, constituent of who we actually are. In light of this view, the disposition of a servant and the stewardship model fall a little bit short. Granting all that it has to offer, and it does offer a great deal, we would like to propose that there is still a more excellent way, and that is the disposition of a son. This is modeled for us by Christ himself, who obeys the Father simply out of love for the Father. It is true that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the round world and all who dwell in it, as the psalmist says, but it is also true that the Lord, out of his love for mankind, has given everything to us. All that is mine is yours, says the father to the elder son in the tale of the prodigals. We, in imitation of the father who gives everything to us, return everything to the father in thanksgiving and love. This is ultimately, I submit, a liturgical function. And it underscores for the Orthodox the importance of an ecclesial response to ecological issues. The closer we approach the status of sons, the greater our intimacy with God. The more intimate we are with God, the greater our sanctification and our holiness, and the more we are healed from sin and from the corrupting influence of the passions. When the microcosm, man, is healed, the macrocosm, the rest of creation, will be healed as well. For the state of the macrocosm reveals the state of the microcosm and vice versa. That's why, by the way, it's important that the ascetical practices of the church not be diverted to any other purpose than the sanctification of mankind. They serve the environment best when they serve our sanctification the most. And the little excerpt from the monograph, which was included in your program today, speaks more specifically to the role of authentic Christian asceticism and uh, the false use of it in environmental circles. Okay, so I refer you to that. How do we flesh out this notion of the son's relationship to the father? How do we live ourselves? as sons of the Father and reap the benefits of an enhanced understanding and so are able most effectively to deal with the environment. We suggest that we look to Christ himself and to his work in redeeming us, particularly in the traditionally acknowledged roles of, his, of king, prophet, and priest. First, with regards to the status of kingship. 
St. Gregory the theologian says that Adam was king of all upon the earth, but subject to the king above. Adam's kingship is tied to the notion of dominion, which was given in the first chapter of Genesis. You know that. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. All right? We won't enter into a general discussion of the dominion mandate here. Uh, some have found it problematic. Lynn White found the dominion model uh, part of the root of the problem of Christianity and hurting the environment. Uh, there are ways of affirming the dominion mandate that avoid some of its negative connotations. We lay out some of that uh, in the monograph. I don't want to uh, go into that here. But because we are earthly and heavenly, temporal and immortal, visible yet intellectual, halfway between greatness and lowliness, in one person combining flesh and spirit, to quote St. Gregory again, we stand not only as microcosms of the cosmos, but also as mediators of the creation back to the creator. It is our role as the kings of creation, and queens, I suppose, not simply to dominate or to administer the created order on our own, or by our own devices, or for our own ends, but to dominate and order the world by uniting it to God. Only in union with God can the right ordering of the world be accomplished. Christ himself began this work of recapitulation through his own passion, death, and resurrection. And as they say, as we are incorporated into Christ and become members of his body through baptism, likewise we are able to enter into this work as well in our own lives. Secondly, in Christ's role as prophet, we have to wade into a little deeper theology again. I am sorry. The prophetic role is closely tied to this notion of natural contemplation, which I mentioned earlier. Natural contemplation is necessarily founded on the basis of our own ascetical effort in the practical life of following Christ. The state of contemplation is one of dispassion. The Greek term for it is apathia, where we get the English word apathy. But it's not what it means in the technical sense. We're not talking about apathy, but rather one of interior freedom, the calm of detachment, in which the passions are quieted and no longer have a free reign in the soul, and inner freedom opens up to us the possibility of loving God and loving our neighbor and loving the whole created order in a respectful, non-possessive way, dispassionately or disinterestedly. It sounds ideal, but I mean, take as a very low-level example of what this means. Imagine what climate science would look like if it did not have a heavy overlay of partisanship, if it were undertaken from simple love of the truth to try to find out objectively what is going on with the climate, and it wasn't jockeying for government funding, looking for government subsidies, trying to be undertaken to promote favored projects or industries without fear-mongering, without the lust of power, and without being polemical. But simple science undertaken is simple science without all of that other stuff. That would go a long way towards what I'm talking about, the fundamentals of natural contemplation, a real disinterested, dispassionate undertaking of trying to find the truth. And that's not so difficult to understand. It may be very difficult to come by in practice, but uh, uh, that's sort of what I'm talking about. Contemplation consists of two stages. The latter stage, of course, and the ultimate aim of contemplation is union with God through pure prayer. But the earlier stages is to come to a knowledge of creatures through contemplation of their nature. This kind of natural contemplation consists in perceiving what I called earlier the logi of things, to try to find out God's intention or purposes when he created different things. The contemplation of the logi in creation belonged to the work of the spirit in man's sanctification and deification. It is an intellectual undertaking for sure, but it is not separate from our spiritual growth, but an integral part of it. As I said, the logos of a thing, the logos of its nature, is the presence of the divine wisdom, the presence of the word of God in created things. Being there, it cannot be corrupted by the fall. However, the way in which a particular thing or a person lives out that logos, that intention for them, is subject to variation. And given the fall, the manner or the mode in which we exist for creatures, we're all unstable and disordered and corrupted. That's the meaning of the fall. 
The practical life of asceticism, which the church enjoins upon us, is functionally to stabilize and to reintegrate our lives according to God's intention or purpose for us, that is, according to our own logos and God's design. Once this stability and reintegration begins to be manifest, natural contemplation becomes possible. If natural contemplation fulfills our prophetic role by revealing to us God's purpose in created things through recognizing uh, their logi, it requires the attentiveness of dispassion so that the mind, stripped three of covetousness and of all the passions, is able to see things not simply as they are, and certainly not as we would like them to be, but as God intends for them to be. This recognition of Logi, which begins in a scientific investigation of the, of the actual phenomenal world, and the fathers speak of that. St. Maximus the Confessor himself says that, that the beginnings of contemplation are, are epistemonikos, scientific. It matures in its later stages into an, to an intuitive grasp of the inner principles of things, and ultimately we're able to see the unity of everything in creation in the one Logos, in the Word of God. And so what we have is that natural com contemplation proceeds from seeing God in the rest of the world till ultimately we began to see the rest of the world in God. So while it begins with scientific investigation, discursive reason and insight, it proceeds to a more immediate apprehension or intuition. All right. Now, when discussing natural contemplation, we are not talking about an impossibly high standard of spiritual achievement here, okay? Uh, please don't let it dismay you. St. Paul tells the Romans, ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, have been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. St. Paul is laying out for us the beginnings of natural contemplation. We can come to know something about God from the natural world around us. Abba Evagrius of Pontus in the 4th century says, uh, even for those who are far from God, God has made it possible for them to come near to the knowledge of him and to his love for them through the medium of creatures. Now, we're not suggesting that anybody here become a mystic in the sense that this word has acquired in the West. Rather, what we'd like to suggest is that if you give a little loving attention to the world, particularly in your own home, in your family, your place of business, in your neighborhood. If you look at your line of work a little dispassionately, if you look at your life in the light of the risen Christ, it can be enough to make a beginning. Then very humble and simple things are recognized as more than they are. St. Benedict says in his holy rule, regard all the utensils of the monastery and its whole property as if they were the sacred vessels of the altar. For indeed, in the light of natural contemplation, they're revealed to be just that, more than we, than we thought that they were. And a person with this kind of insight is able to become a priest at the altar of his own heart, celebrating a cosmic liturgy of which the fathers speak. Language, work, art, culture, the humanities, the natural world itself, all of creation finds its meaning in the Logos, and it is possible for us to discern that. The third stage, the priestly role. As we said previously, man as a microcosm of the whole world, and his status as microcosm is in service of his role as a mediator. That is, he's called to unify through himself all the parts of creation. This is part of the dignity of human persons and our ability to create events of communion, if you will, whereby created things are freed from their limitations and referred to something greater than themselves. To re be referred to God is precisely the priestly function of all mankind. Again, to go back to Father Dimitri Staniloy, who spoke most of this, he had a, no in a notion of the whole of mankind as priests of creation because Adam was originally tasked with the role of mediation, of serving this cosmic liturgy, as it were. Staniloy saw that humanity kind of had a kind of natural priesthood that is inherent in all of us. Congratulations, you've all been promoted and ordained. It was Adam and Eve's task to exercise this natural priesthood by offering the world that they received from God back to him in thanksgiving. And part of that offering including, included comprehending it and shaping it and developing it, all of the unlimited potential that was to be found in nature. 
And so in Stanilloy's thought, and in all of Orthodox thought, this even extends to including scientific discovery and technical application of things that have been discovered. See, the Orthodox are not so backward after all. And because Orthodox the theology teaches that the fall corrupts human nature, but does not completely destroy it, our natural priesthood was certainly impoverished by the fall, to be sure, but it was not rendered totally ineffective. And given this understanding, Orthodoxy then can encourage and support positive views of science and technological innovation. The natural priesthood that's common to all humanity finds its fulfillment, of course, in the universal priesthood of all Christian believers. As creation becomes transparent to God through Christ, so we who are baptized in Christ have the capacity to see the transparency of creation too. We can perceive its spiritual dimension and thus creation, see creation as a mystery, as a sacrament, as a visible sign in the means for the communication with God's grace. And it is the responsibility of the universal priesthood of all Christians to recognize the world as a sacrament, to spiritualize the world, and to offer it as a gift to God. But also, having offered up the world to God, to receive it back from Him, and to carry that blessing back into the world, into the rest of our lives, so that the rest of mankind and the whole creation can also be transformed, and we can be a blessing to the rest of the world. Thus, through a liturgical action, human persons serving as priests of creation recreate and elevate the whole natural order so that all of nature can be restored to the pr primary goodness that God had for it in the beginning when God saw that all that he had made and found that it was good. It can be good again. Creation can acquire a depth of meaning that it otherwise would not have attained because Human persons recognize the Logi, God's principle or purposes for which he created everything in the world. The world can be treated with the reverence due to everything that belongs to God. It can be freed from natural limitations because it is handled according to its true potential intended by God. And it can be united to God through, through Christ who is all and in all, as it says in Colossians. And having accomplished all of this, the natural order is then transfigured by grace and can be received back into our hands and be used for human flourishing in ways not previously realized. The world can be better than it is, and what had previously been corrupted through the fall can now become life-bearing again. And all of this potential is realized when human persons act freely according to the image of God in themselves and offer to God his own of his own on behalf of all and for all. That is a whole lot. But in summary, I'd just like to point out a few of the things, well, the things which I've highlighted now, which I think can provide some theological basis, a little bit of chewing and a little bit of thought to help in, uh, uh, inform a Christian approach to environmentalism, a cosmic approach to theology that sees the redemption of mankind seated within a broader context of the, re of the redemption of the entire world. The creation as a Trinitarian act, which also gives language to express the imminence of God and God's logos in creation so that we can see the presence of God in the created world. To put back man as the center of creation and to see him in a role as a microcosm and a mediator. And even to say that man is not even a part of creation, but that creation is a part of us. To look at the way of living in the world, not in slavish or servile ways, but as sons and daughters of the king to express a kingly role of dominion, albeit subject to the king who is above, to exercise a prophetic role of natural contemplation, of perceiving what God intended the world to be, and to see the whole creation in the light of God's grace, and finally to serve in a priestly role of offering up all of creation to God in behalf of all and for all, and to receive back that which has been blessed in order to sanctify the rest of the world around us. Uh, Forgive me if that's a bit of a heavy dessert on top of your lunch, uh, but perhaps it will give us some basis uh, for questions, answers, comments, and back and forth. That's all I have by way of prepared remarks. I, uh, Dr. Morrison, I thank you for your attention and let us know uh, how we can be of further service to you. Thank, thank you very much, <laughs> Father Michael. Thank you, Andy. Uh, 
we, we would like to take some questions. So if, if you have a question or a comment. Thank you both for your, uh, for your talk. It was a great talk. Um, Father, uh, you basically gave all of us a much more difficult uh, thing to accomplish, more so than even reducing carbon emissions. Um, you know, we're try you're, you're asking us to try and become more Christ-like, which is the journey that we all need to go through. And one of the things... Yeah, I'm ordained and paid to do that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that struck out or stuck out to me is your um, uh, uh, classification of the stewardship, the slave, servant, and son. And you almost seem to talk about it in discrete terms. And I, uh, as I listened to more of your talk, it seemed like those actions are a natural progress that we move from slave to son uh, as we realize the problem and then come to solutions for the problem. Um, you know, specifically, you talk about slave uh, with the fear of punishment. And I think the, the, um, with the state of the... Uh, with the state of the environment, there are a lot of fear mongers. I think that's important to get us as humans motivated. However, it seems like we've stagnated in that slave mentality. Um, I, I guess I would just like your comment on the slave, servant, and son, if that is also a, um, a, a, a path towards being Christ-like, as you were describing in your... Talk. Yes, I, I think it is. Um, um, as I say, the, uh, it, it, the classification is fairly common among a number of the fathers, uh, and I, I freely admit that they do sort of form a continuum, you know, and uh, those of us who came to Christ through a good hellfire and brimstone sermon, we hope, con uh, you know, I, I hope you continue that your, your motivations have been purified and elevated over time to where we are no longer in cringing fear of our Father, but we come, we come to love him. As St. Anthony the Great famously said, I no longer fear God because I love him. Uh, and over time, yeah, we can start with, it, if there is a serious issue, okay, if it deserves alarm, let's have some alarm, but let's get beyond that and, and whipping up froth and frenzy and, and, and approach it in a way that's, that's a, a little more mature and uh, foresightful. Do you have anything to... I have a question. Uh, I have <clears throat> had a decades-long discussion with an English atheist friend, and one of the smaller topics that he raised, I tried, I said, wrote to him that uh, God loves all that he created. So his question to me is, if God loved the dinosaurs and their various forms, it was not man that uh, made them extinct. Why did God choose to make them extinct if he loved them? I guess he's done with them. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know that, that strikes me as a very difficult question to answer. Um, you know, um, I'm sure God loves snow too, but I'm very glad that it's over with. You know, we've had a dreadful winter, um, and um, I don't know. Perhaps you know, perhaps I'm the only dinosaur left in the room. But uh, I, I'm not sure what to do with that. Forgive me. Oh, you're not done with me. Okay, Father Michael, it's good to see you again. Um, yes, sir. I'm uh, with the answer of the dinosaurs. It might be because he loves us more. Maybe, and we couldn't coexist. But anyway, um, I'm surprised you didn't say much, if anything, about the orthodox distinction between the divine essence and energies. That would seem to fit perfectly in the distinguishing between, uh, if, if you don't make that distinction, you know, people then can then abuse the environment because it's not connected to God at all. Yes. And on the other hand, they could deify it as if it is God, whereas maintaining the distinction between the essence and energies of God would allow for a proper view. It gives the room for your position to take root. Uh, yes, sir. I had all of about 30 minutes in which to make this presentation. I, I do deal with St. Gregory Palamas okay. in the monograph. Yes. Uh, direct this to uh, both uh, Mr. Morris and Father. Um, 
There seems to be a conflict between God's command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, which he's clearly said a few times, and some of the more rabid environmentalists, like Paul Ehrlich, that wrote, wrote at one time, uh, they use the word sustainability a lot. And I think at one point he felt that the sustainable population from America was about 100 million, so there's about 200 million of us going to have to go away. And I wonder, what what is your perspective, uh, the, the apparent conflict between the argument of sustainability requiring population control, limiting the number of people, and God's command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, one, one response is, you know, the answer to Paul Ehrlich is Julian Simon, uh, the economist who uh, wrote a book called The Ultimate Resource, in which he said man is the ultimate resource, right? That the, the source of creativity and excite it, it solves problems, right? So one uh, response is that... Um, Ehrlich one has simply been wrong repeatedly, and he had a famous bet with Julian Simon where they bet on the future prices of a basket of commodities, and the bet was, you know, if, if the world was going to hell and population was going to put all these pressures on us, the prices of these things should go up. Well, it turns out the prices went down. Um, and if you look at virtually everything we do, the resource intensity of our lives has gotten lower because of technology. Uh, so we... Uh, part of it is moving into sort of more knowledge-based industries and so forth, but just refrigerators. I love refrigerators because, one, I like fresh food, but you know, think about the refrigerators over your lifespan. So refrigerators, if you, if you graph the size of American refrigerators, they've gotten bigger over time, and they've certainly gotten features, right? I remember my mother defrosting the freezer, and now they defrost themselves. Well, how do you, how do you defrost it? You heat it up, and so the freezer is heating up. It's using energy, right, to melt the frost and make it go away. And yet the energy use in, in, a, in, a, in a refrigerator has gone down dramatically. And the, and the, the point of inflection where, where it changed is before any government action. It's when the price of energy went up. So people respond, you know, it, it, I think it's a good thing, right, that God created the world such that we don't depend on the benevolence of butchers and bakers for our bread and, and, and food, right? He, we, we, the self-interest of others has turned out to make the world continually get better. And so that one answer to this sort of crisis atmosphere is it turns out that technology often solves things. So uh, we have made it possible for so many more humans to live. Well, I think that's a great thing, right? Where's the next Beethoven? Where's the next Leonardo da Vinci, right? There, there's going to be terrific things happening because of all those people. And you look at societies that have limited population, and Ehrlich and others were very much advocates of heavy-handed limits, much as China has experienced and is now relaxing. And you look at some of the, the sort of distortions to Chinese society that have resulted, and it's really a, a tragedy, right? The, the shortage of women in China today because of the, the selective abortion of, of female uh, fetuses, because if you're only going to have one child, people wanted a man, uh, because that, that he would earn more money and so provide for the parents, right? So, I mean, these horrible things happen when we, we try to take these measures. Uh, and you get really, really uh, open in the 60s, people like Ehrlich very openly advocated basically totalitarian solutions to this problem. Another question. This question is for The Economist. Oh. You mentioned that the Endangered Species Act got the incentives wrong. If you as an economist could rewrite that law, what incentives would you get right or change? Well, uh, so it turns out uh, private groups have uh, done a lot of great conservation efforts. So let me just give you an example. Ducks Unlimited, who are people who like to shoot ducks, uh, and so want there to be lots of ducks around, have discovered that uh, ducks are migratory birds, and uh, there are these uh, prairie potholes. So all throughout the Midwest, the, the ducks migrate up and and down through the United States, and they like to land in little marshy areas. And uh, as the price of corn has gone up, in part because of government programs for ethanol and so forth, people started plowing up the prairie potholes and putting in cornfields. Well, it turns out uh, this little swampy bit that the ducks like is the least productive part of the farm. And so Ducks Unlimited sort of organized and raised money and went to the uh, farmers and said, you know, we'll pay you to leave that as a little marsh. And the farmer's like, well, I don't really like plowing that part anyway because the stuff gets stuck and, you know, it's not very productive. So, so for modest sums, a private group was able to create this sort of chain of prairie potholes that allows the ducks to migrate up and down. There are more ducks. The hunters get to eat them. Uh, all is good. So we can do more like that. 
The Department of Agriculture already does a conservation reserve program where they pay people to take uh, environmentally important lands, which often turn out to be not particularly uh, valuable at, from an agricultural point of view out of production. There's some problems with that because of issues with USDA, but the basic idea that creating incentives to preserve habitat helps. Uh, just allowing banking of uh, habitat turns out to help. So international paper has is managing a lot of its forests where it's being able to create uh, sort of woodpecker credits uh, that it, you know, so you relocate some woodpeckers onto their uh, property and they, they maintain it uh, for that. And, and then it turns out that places that woodpeckers like, deer like too, so they can lease it for hunting, right? So there's uh, a lot of opportunities. Uh, Terry Anderson at uh, the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana. Bozeman has two free market environmental centers, uh, not just free. Uh, so it's the highest concentration of market-oriented environmentalists in the country. But he wrote a book called Free Market Environmentalism. And there's a lot of opportunities there. So the short answer would be I would create incentives for people to do the right thing. And I would really put a focus on sort of these voluntary agreements that are negotiated, you know, facilitating those kind of agreements. I think we see a lot more species protection. The Nature Conservancy is another great example of an organization that uh, privately has protected a lot of habitat because they were able to adapt from species to habitat once we learned about that. There seems to be a willingness to uh, squander human capital in the interest of avoiding fossil fuels. One example would be the uh, fuel standards on automobiles. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the CAFE standards led to lighter cars, and that led to more fatalities. And, uh, you know, and as you would expect, right, people are creative. So that's why we have lots of people driving pickup trucks, right? Because pickup trucks weren't originally included in the CAFE standards, so people switched to light trucks. So that produced SUVs. And so there's a never-ending cycle of, of regulation, right? Whereas if, uh, you know, you really wanted to stop people burning gasoline, you would just make it more expensive. But that turns out to be politically very unpopular. Uh, so we do things in, a, in a, a, a backwards way. All right. Thank you for your, your talk. I, I have a question that you somewhat answered, but maybe um, you, could, you could deal with again. And that is, there seems to be these questions on economics, right? Well... You know, Professor Morris has just given us some really logical, rational reason, the example of Ducks Unlimited, and et cetera, of ways to do this. And you've talked about, Father, some of the theological problems. But it seems that going to both the economist and, and the theologian slash psychologist here, that there's something else, right? This is not a problem of reason. I mean, this is pretty evident that the, the uh, Endangered Species Act ends up being shoot, shovel, and shut up, and... and mm -hmm kills all the animals or doesn't, doesn't work. Um, Paul Ehrlich has been proven wrong time and time again. Uh, global warming, used to be global cooling, then it was global warming, then it was climate change, now it's climate disruption. I mean, so there's, it's not a, it's not a reasonable problem. It seems to be a spiritual and psychological problem. Could both of you address that? I, that would be, I'd be interested to hear how you would think, like, what's the real core of this um, ideology that leads to whatever death for children, no fossil fuels, whatever it might be, and there's something else going on. I don't know as I can speak to the core of it. Um, uh, in doing this research and in in following it in um, in, in in more popular news sources, uh, I'm just continually struck at how much environmental language and rhetoric mimics religious language and rhetoric. Um, people speak mockingly of the Church of Environmentalism, or the Green Church or whatnot. Um, if you disagree with climate change, you're a denier, which just makes you a heretic. You must be done away with. What was it? Someone recently was calling for climate deniers, what, to be, to be jailed or killed? One or the other. I can't remember. It was terrible. You know, the Inquisition is back now. It just wears a a green shirt, but you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are orthodoxies to be maintained and you know, heretics to be burned. And, not burned. And, oh, not burned, okay. <laughs> Buried, that's right. High carbon footprint. I don't know, what is, what, 
Now, let's, let's not go into the most e ecologically friendly way of doing in your opponents. Uh, but uh, uh, just the religious imagery seems to be taken up very large. It seems to be taken largely from the church. You kind of wonder uh, if, if some of it is, is, uh, is not, in fact, a substitute for Christ. Churches without Christ in some respect or religious sentiment so that, uh, which people have a natural and, and an inherent hunger for but for some reason will not go to Christ or able somehow to satisfy some sense of that uh, uh, in so other causes, environmentalism being one of them. That's pure speculation on my part, and take, take that for what it's worth. Andy, you've got to take... So uh, Robert Nelson at the University of Maryland has uh, written about environmentalism as a religion, uh, and uh, very, very powerfully in a particular book called The New Holy Wars, economic versus environmental religion. He also talks about economics as a religion, a religion of progress and the clash of a religion of progress and the perfectibility of man with a religion of um, uh, revering the natural world and sort of taking us back to, to Eden. And uh, really, I think, has done a very thorough job of learning theology and, and putting it in. And he points out that most of the founders of the modern American environmental movement were Calvinists, and use very Calvinist ideas, right? It's, uh, but, but, but draw on ideas that were in language from their upbringing and take those concepts and then twist them to get to where they want to go. But there's a very rich connection uh, between uh, American Protestantism in particular and the environmentalism. And he, he does a really good job in this book, The New Holy Wars, which I highly recommend, is a, a terrific history of economic thought. He also has a book called Reaching for Heaven on Earth uh, about uh, the sort of progressive notion of economics and development uh, that is, is also terrific. Uh, Bob says that he hoped that he would get a debate going. Instead, what the environmentalists and the economists agreed was they both hated him uh, <laughs> uh, because he, he made them both mad by calling, saying that they would produce religions. But he'd hoped to sort of get incite uh, discussion and said he incited an angry mob uh, out for him. So. One more? Okay. One more question. I'll address this one to, to Andy. Uh, Andy, most of the information that the public gets is more propaganda than information for what our kids get in school, what comes across the airwaves, uh, what our government officials and, and our government agencies are putting out. Where are some really accurate sources of information on what's happening with the environment. You know, we hear that polar bears are almost extinct, and then we read that they're flourishing. And so it seems that the reality is almost contrary to everything you hear that is settled truth. Where do you go to get solid information? Well, so that is a real problem. Um, Jane Shaw wrote a book back in the 90s called Facts Not Fear. She wrote, I forget her co-author's name, which sort of went through the curriculum, uh, school curriculum on environmental issues and said, you know, what's really happening? And then, you know, the best known example of this is Bjorn Lomborg, uh, this, who wrote a book, The Skeptical Environmentalist. Now, this is a, a, a gay Danish member of Greenpeace. Right, so you know, and he said, you know, the world is going to hell, and yet I don't sort of observe that happening around me. What's really going on? And he, and he's a, he was a trained statistician, and he went and did this, and he wrote this book, and he's been pilloried as a result uh, for that. But again, he just sort of goes through, and uh, the book has been attacked and critiqued, and very few and mostly minor errors have been found in it. But he just said, what is, what's the real... So you, you can go to places like that. He has a website uh, called the Copenhagen Consensus, that I highly recommend. He, he runs a process where he invites, um, say, a group of um, uh, Nobel laureates or uh, UN ambassadors or some distinguished group to come, and he presents them with some facts, and then he says, please rank the following uh, world problem. You have to rank them. You can't say we have to do them all. And it, it usually turns out things like uh, addressing malaria, which we actually know how to do, come at the top. Uh, and things that we don't know how to, what to do with. He said, well, you know, let's wait and we'll figure that one out later. But right now we can stop a couple, you know, 100,000 people dying of malaria next year, right? We just, we just need to write a check. We know, what to, we know exactly what to do. And so he's, he's really promoted a dialogue that's led to that. Uh, and so I think you have to sort of seek out people like that in this book, Facts Not Fear, uh, that Jane Shaw did as a good starting point as well. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Father Michael oh, thank you. and Andy one more time.
As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Jaja.